Professor Arkoulos, welcome. So a terrible tragedy has occurred on this island volcano in the last 24 hours. What can you tell us about White Island? Well, it's a spectacular place uh, to visit. It's also scientifically fascinating. It's relatively accessible. And it's a wonderful example of a volcano where a magmatic system, the sort of thing everybody associates with volcanoes, is interacting with a, a water system. Uh, the, the groundwater is made up of rainfall and seawater. And occasionally when that interacts with rising magma or ponded magma in the crust, you can get uh, a lot of trouble. And that kind of interaction has been the subject of many studies, New Zealanders and people from all around the world. So there's great interest just from a scenic point of view that you're allowed to get into the throat of a, what is an active volcano, and also scientifically, and that's what attracts many people to the island. So, so talk us through about what you expect led to this eruption yesterday. Well, uh, one of my vulcan volcanological uh, colleagues told me this morning, yes, it's like a giant pressure cooker where the safety valve is blocked off and eventually the seal ruptures with increased pressure and it goes bang. And it wasn't giving off the usual signs that people associate with uh, impending eruptions. Uh, volcanologists have got very good at predicting uh, major eruptive sequences, uh, such as earthquakes uh, below the volcano, which contract magma, rising its way to the surface, uh, essentially a natural fracking process, or the inflation of the volcano as the magma uh, rises up further and uh, pushes the crust of the earth upwards, or changes in gas emissions. All of that stuff, uh, the uh, volcano has monitors and regular visits, so people can track that behavior very well. But when you've got a magma resident in the crust at fairly shallow levels interacting with uh, groundwater, a whole series of other reactions and processes take place. And it looks like, uh, certainly from this distance, uh, that uh, the failure of the crust in some way allowed uh, some of that water to access the magma more directly. And in that case, you get flashing of the water into steam, big expansion in volume, and if the uh, the lid keeping the uh, magma water system in place fails, then an explosion results. Mm -hmm. And all of that uh, kind of process can take place with very little warning indeed. And Richard, had you been to the island yourself a couple of times, and uh, what can you tell from the pictures you've seen about the nature of this explosion? Does it appear the uh, eruption has pushed from the crater directly towards the jetty area and if you've been there before enough are you if you're familiar with it can you tell us that um, about the history of that has the the crater previously been um, uh, broke broken away and whenever it erupts it pushes um, uh, material down a particular path well it can do and in the case of white island the pictures you'll have seen taken from the air show a breach crater it's breached off to the east yeah so in the past that that side of the volcano has failed uh, in the case of an explosion coming out of a hole in the ground typically a lot of that energy is transferred straight up into the air so the ash column for example that resulted oh and by the way uh, when you look at the images you see both white and black in that eruption cloud the black is fragmented rock the white is probably mostly steam uh, but most of it goes up into the air, fortunately. If all that energy was directed at you, it'd be terrible. But when you get an explosion just broaching the surface of the Earth, you also get uh, an explosion travelling laterally, a so-called lateral blast. So if you were anywhere between the crater lake at the west end of that uh, crater and the jetty, it's likely that the blast, as it came out of the ground, would not only be travelling vertically, but also ground-hugging. Mm. So it's not easy to, avo it's not easy to avoid that. Uh, we see these kind of things, by the way, the classic, they're called base surges. And they're associated with nuclear detonations underwater. And you see uh, typically those kind of uh, experiments that have been run in the past. That when the nuclear blast goes off, well, yeah, sure, a lot of it goes up in the air. And some of it comes scooting across the water straight at you as the uh, blast wave has broached the sea surface and headed out laterally. So probably within that crater, it would have been a terrible place to be. Mm -hmm. There would be nowhere safe for you to be hiding thinking that, oh, well, if it explodes, it just goes straight up in the air. Yeah. And have you, have you been there before and have you walked up that path from the jetty to the crater? Yes, I've been there many times, actually, and uh, taken that same trip and gone, gone and stood uh, on the wall of the crater lake and uh, with some care because it's not stable. And if you fell in, it, you'd be falling into boiling water. So, yes, it's a trip that many tourists take, either having arrived by boat or by helicopter. And there's an image that's been uh, published widely uh, showing some people da down what appears to be inside the crowd. I'm not familiar with the term, so maybe you can help us here. But they seem to be 
inside the, the crater. Um, are you aware of those photos? It was there's an image. It was taken at I think it was 2:10, and the explosion happened at 2:11. Can you describe where those people would have been at the time? Yeah, there's a track that takes you in a kind of circular tour. Uh, from the jetty around uh, the, on the floor of the crater and around some of the uh, the base where the walls meet the crater floor. It's hummocky terrain, nothing, nothing too strenuous, and the path basically ends up at the edge of the crater lake and then you'd return down the other side of the crater. So those people were approaching the edge of the crater lake uh, are totally exposed. If that was where the uh, failure and the explosion was sourced from, a very exposed place to be. Yeah. And so you say they would have been approaching the crater lake. The, the, what, what would you describe the place that they were at the time? Were they, were they actually inside the crater? Yes, yes. Yeah. You, uh, you, you can go around on the outside on the crest of the crater and that's where some of the... That, that footage, for example, is a webcam. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the crater is under continuous surveillance with a camera or two. Uh, but you, generally the tourists, don't, don't go wandering around the outside of the volcano or around the rim. So you're in the floor of the crater. Yeah, and so d does it appear the eruption ha happened like like that the the top of that crater has actually blown? That's previously blown. The, the whole yeah. the major topography is due to a much bigger explosion and uh, collapse of a cone. So it would have been a nice symmetrical cone, and it's failed, and all that debris has gone out eastwards. So what you're seeing now is a rebuilding of the structure of the volcano. Uh, in terms of uh, new deposits of lava and ash, and eventually it might restore itself to be a cone, but uh, what, what you're looking at is a topography that's been uh, made before anybody got there to, to witness yeah. it uh, by a failure of the vo volcanic slopes. And so what do you know about the heightened activity in the past two weeks? We heard in that media conference, the main media conference, the first one yesterday afternoon, an expert describing that the alert level had been raised and because of heightened activity, I think he mentioned sulphur readings and one other thing. Yes, for the last two months actually, the Geological and Nuclear Sciences Group in New Zealand they, they are responsible for monitoring all of the active all the volcanoes in New Zealand, including the ones on land heading south towards Ruapehu and White Island itself. And uh, they, they've been reporting increased uh, gas release, sulphur dioxide in particular, uh, a greater activity in the lake, more boiling, more stuff getting thrown out, more mud, mud pot type activity. Uh, so all of that is kind of a standard uh, set of characteristics that the volcano experts monitor. Uh, but the rapid escalation, instead of some, uh, for example, minor puffs of ash and blocks being thrown out of the vent, where you might think, yeah, OK, uh, this is going to get worse before it gets better, it uh, ended up with this uh, eruption reaching 4,000 metres or so in the air. So there was no 50-metre jets, 100, 500-metre jets that allowed everybody plenty of warning to get out of the way. It was just a, a single event that became very energetic indeed compared to the way it's been behaving in the last two months. Yeah, so two volcanologists who um, uh, are responsible for this alert level, this came as a surprise as well? Oh, yes, yeah. absolutely. You, you, you'd be rest assured that if they had any inkling whatsoever, they'd have raised the alert level to much higher, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that would have been a warning to all the tour operators not to get close to it. Yeah. And so what, what, what else would have to have happened for it to get to um, a higher level of alert? Uh, because it was, at a, it was at a number two, I think. Yes, yeah, so, well, some injections of material. So some of that uh, black dust and steam that you see uh, going up in the big column yesterday afternoon, some smaller, smaller scale versions of that, or increased seismic activity or more changes in the way the, the lake was behaving, such as, for example, a major blowout of the lake and a flood on the crater floor, mm. that would have triggered a higher alert. As someone yourself who's uh, very keen to get a close look at volcanoes, what do you think um, this will lead to in terms of a possible rethink about tour operations on and around volcanoes and, in fact, um, scientists getting, getting close into volcanoes? Well, scientists, of course, will probably think they're so smart they should go anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, tourists, though, is a different matter, and I'm sure there'll be a close examination of uh, the hazards to tourists uh, th this, this is uh, a, a very difficult period for everybody uh, to deal with. I mean, nobody, nobody runs tours to places where they think anybody's going to be harmed. But there's an attraction to this, of course. It's, uh, you know, climbing Stromboli or uh, in the Mediterranean or Yasser volcano. It's a kind of holiday, holiday thing, a, a, a glamour sport, a, a, a semi-dangerous activity. So it's hard to prevent this happening. Uh, but, yes, it'll uh, trigger some thinking about volcano tourism and the intrinsic risks. 
And, and a rethink about what prompts a warning, uh, what prompts a, an increase in the, in the, the alert level? Yes, well, we always learn from these. It's, it, it's a sad case that uh, post facto, we always learn from these events. For example, the Mount St. Helens eruption in 1980, that was a nice cone and the north side of the volcano started bulging at uh, centimetres per day. And that was certainly would have been a warning that the thing was about to blow out. In that case, perhaps that's what you were alluding to earlier. That was a lateral blast. The volcano collapsed on its north side and the blast came out uh, following that uh, uh, slope failure. Uh, but we always learn from all of these events. It, it's only uh, 100 years or more that uh, volcanologists have been examining volcanoes around the world. And uh, the experiences, the individual behaviours of them are always instructive and will inform us for the future. Yeah. Okay, Richard Arkulis, really interesting uh, talking to you. Thanks for your time this morning. My pleasure.